Hi, welcome to this, the fourth session of the history of world revolutions. Today we're going to be looking at the French Revolution, which is probably the most studied, uh, the most uh, interesting in many ways of the three early modern revolutions that we have looked at so far. We've looked at the English Civil War, uh, we've looked at the American Revolution, but in many ways the French Revolution is the one that is seen as the prototypical early modern revolution, one that had far-reaching consequences not only for France itself but for all of humanity because of some of the values, some of the institutions, some of the ideas that were promulgated, brought to the surface uh, during the time of the French Revolution. On the other hand, it's important to keep in mind that in fact many of the things we're going to talk about in terms of the French Revolution are things we've actually seen already either in England or in North America with those revolutions. Some of these ideas were already circulating widely uh, such as ideas from the Enlightenment about the use of reason, the idea of being able to rationally reform society, uh, challenges to the absolute power of monarchs uh, and the question of whether in fact their legitimacy uh, flowed from a divine entity that had granted them the right to rule their people. Uh, the question of the penetration of capitalism, the rise of capitalism, and what that meant, particularly for peasants in the countryside. Uh, these are critical issues in the French Revolution, but we've also seen them elsewhere uh, in England and to some degree in North America. And yet it is true that in the end, it is the French Revolution uh, which has most captured people's imaginations of the early modern revolutions. That and perhaps the Russian and the Chinese revolutions are the three uh, most studied, uh, most fascinating of all the revolutions we're going to look at. In part I think that's because of the fact that the revolution did go to such extremes ultimately, uh, both in terms of the early uh, reactionary forces trying to preserve the old order and ultimately the radical forces that wanted to so dramatically change this society. Perhaps personifying the extremes to which the revolution went uh, was the fate of two men. One of them, Louis XVI. Louis XVI was the king of France at the time of the revolution. And like his forebearers, uh, he was, in his mind at least, uh, an absolute monarch, a monarch who ruled by divine right. And yet, on January 21st, 1793, Louis, having been convicted of treasonous acts against his own people, was taken out to a public site and executed. Just a little over 18 months later, in July of 1794, Maximilien Robespierre, the best known, certainly most powerful of the truly radical leaders of the revolution, was also taken out to a public square and executed. So in the space of 18 months, the revolution seemed to go from one extreme to the other, from eliminating the king, bringing down monarchy, establishing a revolutionary government, and then to the other extreme, of eliminating the most powerful of the radicals who had helped lead the revolution up until that time on a date then known as the 9th of Thermidor. We'll get to that. That has to do with the dating system that the new revolutionary government had created. But the very term 9th of Thermidor has come to refer to when radical revolutions come to an end. What is the point at which the tide is turned and the radical aspects of the revolution begin to diminish and stability returns? Uh, that date, the date on which Robespierre was executed, has come to symbolize that event. However, although there is this seeming disparity, this, these two extremes between the execution of the king and the execution of one of his most radical critics in the space of 18 months, uh, there's a certain gruesome continuity to the two events because the same device was used to execute both men, and that was the guillotine. Now, the guillotine uh, was portrayed and has been portrayed as uh, this device of uh, cruelty, of inhumanity, uh, symbolizing some of the worst aspects of the revolution. Uh, in fact, the guillotine wasn't invented uh, by revolutionaries. It was invented by a French doctor who invented it uh, for humane reasons. He believed that uh, this was the most humane means to carry out capital punishment. Up until that time, uh, people like Charles II, who were going to be executed, even though they might be kings, uh, had to rely on the skill of an axeman's blade. 
and oftentimes the axeman wasn't that skillful and it might take more than one shot to remove your head. Uh, with the blade, uh, with this device uh, designed by Dr. Guillotine, uh, now executions could be carried out far more effectively and far more efficiently and in the minds of many far more humanely. What is the significance of this? Both these men were ultimately uh, brought down by the same device. Uh, simply this, that a critical theme in the revolution is the idea of an age of reason that was uh, penetrating European societies and had been penetrating for several centuries. The idea that rational minds could remake uh, human societies their political systems, their economic systems, their social systems, uh, their sciences, that all of this could be made more rational, more efficient, more effective, more humane, that human beings could live better lives because we could create more efficient, more effective societies. This was one of the critical ideas of the Enlightenment, which we'll, we've talked about a little bit in terms of background in the first session, and we'll talk about again today. Uh, the idea that human beings could use their rational minds to reshape the world around them to make it better for all of humanity. This was the critical idea behind the French Revolution. I said in the first session that and one of the things that is uh, central and consistent in revolutions is that people engage in revolutions and take on revolutionary tasks because they truly believe that there is a better world to be made, that there is hope for humanity. And in a sort of ironic way, uh, this device of death was an expression of that belief that we could create more, a more humane society, a more efficient, a more effective society. And the guillotine in its own way was an expression of that idea. And much of what happens in France in the 1780s and the 1790s is an expression of the same kind of idea, the same kind of idealism that indeed human societies could be made better, in this case through revolutionary action. Now, as we do with each revolution, we're going to look at some historical background first to get an idea of, well, what was France like at this time? What were some of the problems and the issues that would give rise to a revolutionary outbreak? Certainly the best known king in French history uh, was Louis XIV, the Sun King, as he was known, um, a man who said, I am the state. In other words, the French government, what is it with its ministers and its military and all the rest of it? It's me. That's how important uh, the crown is. Uh, there is a significance to this because Louis wasn't really kidding. Uh, this wasn't just a delusion on his part. He was certainly trying to make uh, the monarchy as powerful as possible. He was uh, a monarch who wanted to centralize the state to the maximum degree that he could and he would take steps to do precisely that, as would his successors. So what we see in the French Revolution, one of the themes that we will see carried through here, is the idea that the monarchy, the central government, is trying to enhance its power, is trying to increase the control that it has, much like Charles II did in England, but even to a greater extent uh, than Charles might have imagined. Now, one of the reasons Louis would try to do this uh, is because the society that he ruled over at this time was uh, what we would consider to be a very traditional uh, feudal society. Uh, it is a society uh, with at its top a very small elite, an aristocracy, uh, primarily an aristocracy of birth or blood, people who are born to noble titles. Uh, this is the ruling elite over which the crown has ultimate oversight. Uh, but as in the case of England that we saw earlier, uh, the greatest challenge at any given time to the monarchy was from this same elite. Uh, these were the people that effectively shared power with the monarchy uh, in these traditional societies. So a key issue here was could the crown assert greater control and authority over that aristocracy? Louis's way of doing this, and it's not unique, we see it in many other societies and civilizations over the centuries, uh, was actually uh, to enhance the uh, special privileges that the aristocracy enjoyed. Specifically, the opportunity for them to come and live at court, at Versailles, at this tremendous palace that was built outside of Paris, uh, today as uh, 
two centuries ago. It's one of you know, the great architectural sites uh, in Europe. Uh, here they could enjoy all the pleasures and splendors of life uh, at the royal court. What this meant, of course, was leaving their provincial bastions and coming to Versailles uh, to assume these positions. And these positions had very little authority to go with them. Uh, you became a member of the king's court. You were there for all the endless ceremonies and parties and so forth that went on. It was sort of like an invitation to a, a perpetual party. Uh, but there was a purpose to this. The idea of trying to bring as many members of the aristocracy uh, to the court was, in fact, to diminish their power. If they are there living off the largesse of the crown, they're not out in the countryside. They're not there working uh, in their own communities, building power, conspiring with each other. They're there at court where the crown can keep an eye on them. So this was not a matter of, gee, let's throw an endless party for the aristocracy. The idea was, let's get them here at court and attract them with these opportunities for a leisurely life and get them away from their power bases in the countryside, get them away from the peasants, get them away from each other, where the crown can assert greater control. Now, at the same time, Louis and his successors were anxious to improve the management of the bureaucratic system. One of the ways they would do this is by drawing on people of talent who are not members of the nobility, giving them appointments as administrators within the royal government, and eventually rewarding many of them with noble titles. These people who had relatively recently in the last 100, 200 years by the time of the revolution, achieved noble status as a result of service or the service of their fathers before them, were known as the nobility of the robe. These were people, in other words, who uh, had not risen during the age of uh, knighthood, during the time of the Middle Ages when uh, nobility was uh, bestowed upon people who were warriors and who fought on the side of the crown successfully, etc. These people were relatively recent uh, to the aristocracy, appointed as a result of their bureaucratic activities. So we have really two groups of the nobility. One, the nobility of the sword, uh, who are people from the old aristocracy, whom Louis is trying to essentially um, bring close to the court, uh, remove them from their bases of power in the countryside, and then the nobility of the robe, who are really bureaucrats, people who have perhaps been successful in business, uh, members of the bourgeoisie, as we would call them, uh, and who have done service for the crown and are now given royal appointments. So to keep or try to create a more efficient administrative system, Louis also was making new appointments to the aristocracy, but this was based upon people's accomplishments as bureaucrats. Both of these groups ultimately uh, would enjoy and had enjoyed uh, what are called seniorial rights. Uh, another simple way of saying that, spelling it, uh, is feudal rights. Your rights as a feudal landlord, that you have special privileges. Uh, one privilege that the aristocracy enjoyed, for example, is they basically paid no taxes. Uh, there were land taxes that fell on everyone, although they fell particularly lightly on uh, the nobility. Uh, but other than that, the nobility really didn't have to pay any other taxes. Seniorial rights or feudal rights also specifically referred to the kinds of rights that a landlord had to collect various dues from peasants. And again, we've seen this in England, it's true again in France. Uh, a right to the services of peasants uh, who uh, work the land in his community, that they have to serve for so many days on his estate, uh, harvesting crops. Maybe the wife has to go and help uh, take care of the manor house, the great house on the estate. These are the kinds of rights and privileges that members of the aristocracy are accustomed to in France and enjoy whether they are members uh, of the old aristocracy, uh, the nobility of the sword, or the new aristocracy, the nobility of the robe. So here in this period with Louis XIV, the Sun King, we see these early efforts to take this 
uh, feudal society and begin changing it at least to the extent of centralizing power for the crown, increasing the control that the crown has, both in terms of trying to bring the old aristocracy into the court, removing them from their base of power, and also by these other appointments uh, of people who had served effectively in the bureaucracy and are now given noble titles. Now, beneath the aristocracy, uh, we find what is simply a expansive peasantry that accounts for perhaps 90% of the population in France uh, in the 18th century. The peasants of France by the 18th century are far removed from the worst conditions uh, that existed in the Middle Ages, conditions of serfdom. Uh, what a serf was, uh, was essentially a slave. Uh, here, I can spell that for you. Frank. Put this little sheet up here. Uh, a serf is an individual, a peasant, who is attached to the land. Uh, as a serf, uh, you work the land of a large estate and you belong to the land. Uh, not in the sense that you might think in the song from Oklahoma. Uh, you're literally like a piece of property. If that estate is sold, they'll sell you know, the wagons, you know, the oxen, and the serfs. You go with it. Uh, unlike slaves in, let us say, 19th century uh, America, uh, who might be separated from the land and sold off on their own, uh, the, the serfs had to be kept with the land, but they were essentially in a position of being pieces of property. That has radically changed by the 18th century. By the 18th century, peasants are free, and many of them work their own land. The range of wealth among peasants varies greatly. There are some fairly well-to-do peasants uh, who, well, still far below the status of um, the large landowner, nevertheless might be fairly comfortable, would be the leaders of their community, have a fair amount of land, be able to provide land for their children, etc. Uh, to the other extreme of peasants who are barely eking by. You know, they have just enough land uh, to survive for them, themselves uh, and their families. Other peasants, however, are less fortunate in the sense they really don't have enough uh, land of their own uh, to provide subsistence even for their own families. Uh, they are typically sharecroppers. They are working land, at least on a part-time basis, for the great estate. In other words, there is land that they may have on their own that they produce crops, but then there is other land where they go and work for the large estate, and a portion of that goes back to the landlord. Some people are only sharecroppers. Some peasants, that's all they have, is this position on the estate where everything they produce, a portion of it is taken by the landlord uh, as a part of this sharecropping agreement. And finally, there are those, the least fortunate of all, uh, who have no access to land on the estate or private lands that they own. Uh, they have become essentially wage workers. They're day laborers. When someone needs them, it might be a well-to-do peasant, it might be the landlord. They go and work for a day or two, uh, whatever they can manage, uh, in order to make ends meet. These are people at the bottom rungs of rural society at this time. Now, the Landlord in this diverse array of peasants are held together by a set of obligations and institutions that affect all of their lives. First of all, the feudal rents, part of these seigneurial rights. Uh, feudal rents, uh, there were a variety of them that had to be paid uh, for uh, using certain parts of the land. Simply because you're a member of the village, you have to pay this tax or that tax. Essentially, they're taxes that the landlord can collect from the peasants. In addition, the landlord usually enjoys a certain set of monopolies. Uh, the most famous of these in, in various regions of France was winemaking, that the only one who had a right to actually make wine uh, was the landlord. He was the one that had the wine press. So as a peasant, you may be growing grapes on uh, your piece of land, but if you want to make wine and sell it, and this is a very important commercial crop at this time, you're going to have to go to the landlord. He has the monopoly on the production of wine itself. Uh, so this gives him another way of gaining access to the peasants. And of course, uh, the feudal dues may come in other forms than just cash payments. They also may be an obligation uh, to provide your labor to the landlord at any given time. Finally, there are 
other types of institutions that tie the peasants together towards each other as much as they tie them to the landlord. Uh, the village itself, the peasant village, is an important aspect uh, of this linkage between peasants. Uh, the village as an institution is a community. Peasants typically have lived in this village for generations. Uh, there are specific rules governing their behavior and their activities uh, that are rooted in the village itself. And the village at times serves as an intermediary, uh, whatever the village elders, etc., as an intermediary between the peasants and the landlords. Perhaps the most important resource that the village has at its, its command are the common lands. Common lands are lands controlled essentially by the village and they are meant for everyone's use. Typically what common lands would be used for are for the grazing of animals. If you're trying to use every inch of land that you have for growing crops of various kinds, you really don't have a lot of room left over for grazing any kind of animals, you know, whether it's sheep or cattle or whatever you may have. So the idea that you would have access to the village lands and that you could graze your animals there and use, therefore, every piece of your own land for raising crops is an important advantage. And all the more important the further you are down the scale economically as a peasant. If you're a well-to-do peasant and you have lots of land, well, the common lands, yes, it's a significant benefit, but you're not going to die without them. If you're near the bottom, barely eking it out subsistence on a very small plot of land, then the fact that you can take the one or two cows that you have and graze them on common lands is extremely important to you because otherwise the cow is going to eat what you're eating, which is the crops you're growing. So the common lands were particularly important for people at the bottom of the process. Now, change had been penetrating this feudal system uh, during the 18th century and even earlier. Well, this is technically still a feudal order. In other words, with landlords and peasants who owe each other certain obligations, again, the, the landlord is assumed to have this continuing obligation to protect uh, the peasants, uh, to provide law and order in the area. Uh, the fact is the relationship is changing over time. Uh, increasingly, we see during the 18th century that people from the urban areas, uh, business people, particularly merchants, uh, again, what we call the bourgeoisie, are taking the profits that they make as merchants and investing it in the land. Simple reason for this. Uh, in this day and age, uh, we have a variety of relatively secure ways of investing money. You know, if you want to retire, if you want to buy a house eventually, you know, you go and you buy a CD, you put some money in the stock market, uh, you just put it in the bank in a savings account. There are a variety of ways that you can invest with a reasonable degree of security. With the idea that, well, even the stock market goes down, I might go down 20%, but it's not going to wipe me out. I'm not going to lose everything. <laughs> At least I don't think so. <laughs> Check the market today. Uh, but in the 18th century, there were no such assurances. And even people who are very successful in the mercantile trade internationally, and that's where a lot of money was to be made, uh, knew they faced a very uncertain future. Uh, you might have two or three major shipments of goods a year. And if even one of those ships sinks, as they often did, there went your fortune. You were out of luck. So one of the things that merchants and other business people were anxious to do was invest in things that were relatively secure, you know, that would give them a secure source of income for the future. And that was the land. So if they could buy estates, this was a way of securing at least some of their income for the future. It also gave them at least uh, some status as landowners because you know, they may not have noble titles at this point, but nevertheless they could claim to be you know, local lords. And they may not be part of the aristocracy, but they had a certain standing as large landowners in the countryside. Now, in doing this, these people, again, are not doing it just so they can you know, claim to be you know, the most important person in you know, province X or whatever. They're doing it for economic reasons. And they take their business skills and apply them to the whole issue of feudal rents. And what that means is squeezing more money out of the peasants. Over the centuries, oftentimes, 
feudal dues of various kinds got forgotten. You know that you you know you're required to pay you know a sou a penny to the landlord uh, on the birth of one of your children or you know on Christmas you owe him this. You have to bring in five cords of wood uh, each fall uh, for the landlord. Oftentimes, some of these things just got lost, you know, uh, over time. Uh, there might be a landlord who wasn't uh, particularly ambitious, so he didn't bother enforcing these kinds of things. Well, now the new landlords, the new landowners, these people from the urban areas, are going back and checking the books. If you owe me anything, I'm coming to get it. You know, it's sort of like Scrooge has suddenly become the landlord. He's checking for every nickel and dime that might be available, and he's going to take it out of your hide. There was also the issue, uh, which we saw in England earlier, of inflation. Inflation does become a problem uh, in France, as it does elsewhere, uh, from the 1500s on, as silver pours in from the New World, and as population increases, driving up the demand for food products, there is a rising cost of living. Many of the rents that were due uh, in these relationships were fixed amounts. And again, this puts pressure even on traditional landlords uh, to try to squeeze more money out of the peasants. So although we have what appears to be a very stable kind of feudal relationship in the French countryside in the 18th century, the reality is the pressures are growing uh, as a new group of landlords comes in, people from the urban areas who want to get the maximum return on this investment, which they see as a business investment. And even traditional landlords uh, feel a compulsion to try to squeeze as much as possible because, again, inflation is starting to eat away at some of the feudal dues that they have been collecting over the centuries. So in some ways, capitalism is penetrating the French countryside in the guise of feudalism. You know, people are still collecting what are age-old feudal rents, but in many ways, the motivation here is a profit motive in the end, and it's beginning to take a real toll on the peasantry. And there is going to be growing unrest in the countryside in the 18th century as a result of what is seen as uh, the exploitation of peasants uh, through the system of feudal dues. And there are also attempts along the way to cut away at the rights of the common lands, landlords looking to take advantage of that, that they want to use it exclusively for their use, not for the use of the peasants. These kinds of issues, uh, reinforcing things like monopolies on the production of wine, all of this uh, is beginning to weigh very heavily on the peasant classes uh, in the French countryside. In the urban areas, we again have uh, what on the surface is a very traditional kind of urban setting. Uh, this would be very familiar to people in 17th century England uh, as much as it was to people in 18th century France. The key groups in the urban areas are craftsmen, the most skilled artisans who run their own shops, and merchants. Both groups are organized into guilds. Guilds are professional associations. And again, as we saw in England, guilds are meant to essentially stabilize economic life. Uh, it's most apparent with the artisans or the craftsmen. You know, if you're uh, a silversmith, etc. Uh, the idea of the guild is that the guild helps maintain certain levels of production of goods, the quality of those goods, and the price at which they'll be sold. Uh, that there will be a just price, so that you can earn a just wage, if you will. So the guild system, the idea is uh, to really promote stability, to ensure quality of goods and ensure that the members of the guild are not going to suffer radical losses uh, in their economic activities. And again, this is an age when governments have very little control over the economic system uh, in real terms. You know, unlike today where they can manipulate interest rates and put money into uh, the economy when necessary, initiate widespread public works projects, you know, that's all far ahead in the 20th century. Uh, at this time, there's very little uh, real control that a state can exercise over what's happening to its economy in any given year. So there can be wide price fluctuations. So one of the ideas of the guild was precisely what we need is stability. We're not concerned about huge profits, but rather stability. And it tends to encourage a system in which craftsmen focus on the quality of production of their goods, which they have essentially a paternalistic, patriarchal relationship with the people who work for them, the journeymen. Journeymen are those who are in the shop and apprentices. Uh, journeymen and apprentices are people who are learning the craft. Uh, 
uh, and frequently, uh, although they're not from the craftsman's family, they are treated more or less like family. They may, in fact, live with him uh, while they're learning the trade. Uh, this is not a hard-driving uh, kind of economic system uh, where production is to be maximized and wages are to be kept at their lowest. The idea was that there was a fairly stable kind of set of economic activities and relationships protected by the guild. Now, not everyone fell within these categories. Uh, certainly, they were a minority in any urban area. Uh, far more people were simply wage workers of one kind or another. Uh, they might work uh, in shipping. They might work uh, in mills uh, in terms of the production of flour, etc. Uh, these people really had no protection in terms of what might happen to them. You have a job today. You lose it tomorrow. You're a cartman. You know, you uh, pull a cart that's loaded with wood and deliver it to bakeries so they can fire their ovens. You know, you get out of the cart one day and the horse moves by accident, pulls the cart over your foot, your foot's broken, you're out of a job. Uh, there are no protections. So these people really do live a very tenuous existence. And for them, uh, changes in prices of goods, declines in economic activity would be devastating. There is no social safety network. Uh, nothing has been created of that sort by the state and certainly not by corporations. Uh, there are no really modern corporations and there are no th such things as labor unions. Uh, the closest we would come to those kinds of protections are the people who are in the guilds. They have some type of protection. Now, all of these people uh, would be considered commoners uh, in French society whether we're talking about peasants, uh, talking about uh, merchants, talking about craftsmen, wage workers. In French society, there were really two kinds of people. There were members of the nobility, and then there were commoners. Members of the nobility would include you know, the nobility of the sword, nobility of the robe, churchmen. The high offices of the Catholic Church uh, were really well, some of them were members of the nobility, but even if they weren't, they had their own special privileges as well as members of the church. Uh, they too were exempt from taxation, and the church, much like noble uh, or feudal landowners, collected its own tax called the tithe. So that is one group of privileged individuals who are at the top of society. Everyone else falls into this general category of commoners. Now, within the urban context, uh, there is a distinction uh, among commoners, particularly people at the lower ends of the system. Uh, at the top, we might have wealthy merchants, but people who are craftsmen, people who are journeymen, and uh, people who are wage earners, uh, frequently the term was applied to them, the sans culottes. And what the term means is uh, people without britches. Huh? If you've seen photographs, pictures, I should say, of uh, people in the 18th century, George Washington even, you know, they wear britches. They wear uh, pants that are essentially cut off at their knees and tailored so that they you know, uh, are trim around the knee the area. Uh, people who were of a lower order uh, couldn't afford that. That required some you know, fairly sophisticated tailoring to create those kinds of pants, you know, jod versus what you might call them. Uh, everyone else wore what today is considered the normal, you know, the typical form of pants, you know, long pants so that just hang down over your ankles. That's how this term came about. People who couldn't afford uh, those fancy pants, as we might call them, were called sans culottes. They ranged dramatically, however. I mean, a craftsman, on the one hand, was reasonably well off. A daily wage worker uh, was not well off at all. But as a group, they were considered to have some common interests and concerns about inflation, about the way the economy uh, went, about the availability of uh, food from the countryside. And these people uh, were given the term sans culottes. As we'll see, they play a particularly important role in the revolution, especially in terms of pushing it toward its more radical faces. They are concerned with the urban economy. They are concerned with the fate of the gills. They are also concerned with the inequalities and the unpredictability of the economy at this time. But so many of them uh, were subject to the whims of economic changes and had really no protection uh, from those changes. Should they lose a job? Should uh, 
uh, food prices skyrocket uh, should the economy plummet for a period of time. One concern that the craftsmen had in particular were threats to the guild system. This again, as with what's going on in the countryside, is a subtle shift towards capitalism. And there is no uh, given date. You know, it's not like the American Revolution can say, well, 1776, you know, that's the American Revolution. Uh, with the rise of capitalism, you can't really talk in those terms. You can't say, well, look at in this year, this five year period, this is when capitalism came about. It evolved gradually over several centuries. And in the 18th century, it's making its impact felt uh, in France and not only in the countryside as these urban newcomers start to uh, use feudal rents as a way of making profits for themselves, but also in urban areas. And it isn't just the well-to-do who are engaging in activities like setting up factories. Uh, much of it is much more subtle at a lower level where craftsmen decide, you know, maybe the guild system isn't the best solution for me. Instead of limiting my production and accepting a sort of standard price, perhaps what I should do is try to produce the maximum amount of goods. Uh, they may not be of quite the same quality as my neighbors, but if I can produce a larger amount of goods and can therefore sell them at a lower price, I'll make more money. And over time, and again, this is a gradual process, uh, craftsmen, or a number of them, are starting to move in that direction, to abandon the old system and move towards the idea of capitalist production. Now, we're not here to make 10 you know, unique, wonderful candlesticks this week. We're here to make 100 candlesticks. And if they all look alike and maybe have a couple of flaws, that's OK, because they'll only cost half of what those 10 unique ones would have cost. And I can make more money out, out of that kind of production than I can with the 10. So we see the beginning of threats to the guild system. And we will see that. You know, even the government has an interest in uh, dispensing with the gills. Uh, the government is looking at the economy and looking at inefficiencies and sees the gill system as part of the problem, uh, as a set of institutions that inhibits uh, faster economic growth, greater economic production. So there is an incipient threat to the guild system in the 18th century. And if craftsmen are worried about a variety of issues, one of the things that many of them are worried about is the decline of this traditional system by which they have controlled uh, their part of the economy and their livelihood. And of course, inflation, if it's causing problems in the countryside, is also causing problems in the urban areas. The greatest concern for people in the urban areas is inflation in regards to food prices. This can be an issue of life and death. This isn't just, gee, you know, that food is taking more out of my pocketbook than it used to. Uh, for most people, this is probably the largest expense that they have uh, if they are urban dwellers outside of, you know, members of the nobility, wealthy merchants, uh, the very upper strata of urban society, uh, the typical craftsman, journeyman, uh, apprentice, and certainly wage workers are especially concerned with food prices because that's really where they spend their money. That is how they survive. And food prices go up as they do when there is scarcity, as the population is growing. This causes enormous problems. And they look usually to the government to try to solve those problems. And over time, the French government has intermittently tried to solve those problems, uh, trying to buy additional grain and supply it, particularly to Paris, the largest city, the capital city. Uh, the record there is an uneven one. But there has been an attempt, at least, by the government to do such things. And the people of Paris expect that to continue. Now, as for the state itself, we talked about the efforts at centralization under Louis XIV, the Sun King. These would continue throughout the 18th century. And certainly in France, if we compared the uh, French government in the 18th century to the English government in the 17th century, we'd find that France uh, in the century that we're talking about had go already gone a lot further than the English government ever had in terms of uh, increasing its power within the economic system. It still was a far cry from what any modern government has in terms of control over the economy, but still uh, the state was moving in this direction. State taxation was becoming very widespread, additional taxes being imposed, you know, various sales taxes uh, and other types of taxes, land taxes, as we will see an attempt at an income tax, although that doesn't work, to try to further enhance the power of the state. Because 
if indeed you're going to create a more powerful state, it needs more money. So Fran the French government had designed an elaborate series of taxes in order to support that effort. In addition, and here it really diverges from uh, the British example in the previous century, uh, the state has taken on a role uh, in the manufacture of goods. Uh, the production of iron, for example, a very important part of the early Industrial Revolution. The manufacture of arms for the military. Glass factories and other types of factories uh, that were controlled, owned by the royal government. So the French government is taking a very direct role in the economy in the early emergent factory economy of France in the 18th century by actually running, owning these factories and playing a major role in that part of the economy. So here again we see the state with a far more intrusive role than you would have imagined uh, in England in the 17th century. Now, another way of getting money uh, besides taxation, and taxation was always a problem because people objected uh, to taxes and they always complained, was through the sale of public office. This was a not uncommon practice uh, in Spain, in France, and other countries in Europe in the 16th, 17th, 18th century and beyond. Uh, the idea that to uh, gain revenues for the state, the state would sell a public office. You know, if you want to be you know, I don't know, the minister of X, if you want this role as a provincial governor, okay, you have to pay the government to get the job. This was a quick way of securing uh, revenues for the state. And initially, at least, uh, it wasn't terribly detrimental because the state had some choice. Did they want to sell you the office? I mean, they hopefully uh, could find someone who was willing to buy the position who also had some skills as an administrator. And furthermore, the sale of the office was supposed to be limited to one lifetime. So you bought it. You had the public office for X number of years until you died. Uh, and, and then when you died, your children could not inherit the job. It went back to the state to be sold again. So this gave the state some control uh, over this process and over the quality of administrators. In time, however, uh, as the government became more desperate for money, uh, the state would often allow a renewal of these purchases, and sometimes for more than one lifetime. So you could buy it, but, you know, you'd buy it not only for yourself, but for the next two generations. And at times, these positions were becoming permanent possessions of individual families. This, on the one hand, uh, it might have generated revenue for a short time uh, for the state, but it also had a highly detrimental effect in the sense that a number of office holders were office holders for perpetuity, for all time. Uh, it's hard to have much effect on these people unless you want to take them out and execute them. You know, you're not doing your job. Well, you know, there's no civil service review commission here, you know, that we can say, well, I think we, I can fire you now because you haven't been doing your job. Uh, that's not going to happen because you own the position. The other thing about uh, sale of offices is that why would people buy an office? You know, why do you want this job? You know, somebody's going to pay someone else to take a job in the bureaucracy. Well, of course, the idea was that you could earn some money out of the job. Uh, if you were, for example, responsible for collecting uh, port duties, uh, you were the collector of port duties in Marseille, okay, a critical port. You make a lot of money that way. You put a lot of money in your own pocket. Oh, you're having problems you know, getting your uh, customs documents straightened out. I can help you there because I'm the collector of customs here in the port. Uh, of course, it'll cost you something. Uh, in some ways, this is a way of financing the government, but again, it undermines some of the effectiveness of state reform and centralization of state powers. Uh, gives money to the state in the short term, helps pay for the bureaucracy because people pay for it because they have to bribe officials, but it also in the long term undermines the efficiency of the state as more and more of these people are there for generations. Now, as much as the government had a major role in the economy through the factory system that it controlled and through taxation and through the sale of public office, it nevertheless had to deal with uh, what were known as the palmonts. The palmonts were actually, are supposed to be court systems, and there were 12 of them uh, around France, and the most important being in Paris itself. Now, 
Louis XIV had gone a long way towards undermining some of the authority of the old aristocracy by bringing them to Versailles and sort of, you know, keeping them busy going to dances and so forth. Uh, but that did not mean that the aristocracy in the 18th century simply rolled over and played dead. Uh, the Palmonts were aristocratic institutions. Members of the nobility served in the Palmonts, and the Palmonts had an important function uh, beyond what we would imagine as court systems, and that is royal decrees had to be approved by them. So it's not like the king can just say, all right, I'm decreeing a new tax, or I'm decreeing uh, this type of reform, and that was it. I'm an absolute monarch. Don't worry about it. It's law. This was still a system in which there was considerable power sharing with the aristocracy, despite the measures that Louis had taken to strengthen the power of the monarchy, the truth is these Palmonts had a veto power over any major royal decree that might affect their interests or the interests of others in France. So they are not legislatures, they are not there generating laws, etc., but they can certainly be an effective counter to measures that the court might want to carry out, that the crown might want to see implemented. So there is this significant limitation on the power of the state. So we're seeing, on the one hand, with Louis XIV, this effort towards centralization, a greater role in the economy, with greater taxation and the factories. But there are limitations. There is the sale of public office, which is tending to uh, make it difficult for the crown during the 18th century, certainly the second half of the 18th century, to effect change within the bureaucracy. And we're also seeing with the Palmonts the fact that the aristocracy still has considerable power, at least a veto power, over what the crown may do. So it's not all that clear and simple. Now, the crown recognizes this. It has been taking further measures to try to increase its power, uh, specifically by creating what were known as intendants. And again, I'll spill it on this. What intendants were, yeah, sure, I'll spell it. Intendants were royally appointed officials sent out to the provinces, to the countryside, and the significance of this is that these people were directly responsible to the king. They would report back to him and they would carry out measures that he wanted to see instituted in the provinces. They could essentially circumvent all the other layers of bureaucracy. Now those offices that had been sold to people, the Palmonts, and when the king wanted something done in the provinces, he could in turn to the intendants uh, as direct messengers of his, direct agents of his in the countryside to try to get things done. So it's clear that the crown recognizes the problem that it has here, that uh, it doesn't have all of the control that it might want, all of the centralization of power that it might want. The intendants were an example of trying to get around that. So this contest between the aristocracy and the crown is an ongoing one. The crown wants to centralize power, uh, wants to get the aristocracy to be, you know, you know dumb and happy in Versailles. Uh, they want to increase power in the economy in terms of taxation and the factories. They, you want to use the intendants to do the same thing. But there are serious limitations as well, uh, particularly in the Palmonts, these institutions uh, where the nobility had a say over what the crown could do, what the crown could decree. In this ongoing debate struggle in the 18th century, the aristocracy, interestingly enough, will adopt what we would consider to be revolutionary rhetoric. It is the aristocracy, the nobility, who will first begin talking about the rights of man, equality under the law. And yet, the truth is, without question, the nobility was a bunch of reactionaries. <laughs>
And what I mean by that is they wanted to keep the old order as much as possible. They wanted to go back to the past where the monarchy had less control over them, less power overall. They want to protect the privileges that they have, that they're relatively free of taxation, for example, uh, the privileges of birth that they have, that they're entitled to estates and entitled to privileged lives. They want the old order kept much as it is. But they will, interestingly enough, adopt the words of intellectuals who are seen today as the sort of forefathers of the revolution, the people who provided or uh, popularized many of the ideas that brought on some of the most radical phases of the revolution. But here in our early stages, let us say in the 1770s, uh, it is the aristocracy that's raising these issues about uh, the fact that the crown cannot act arbitrarily that it needs the support of the people, that there is a social contract uh, between the people and the monarch. Uh, hardly the kinds of language you expect to be coming from aristocrats, but for the aristocrats, they were thinking of these ideas in terms of the protection of their privileges. They really weren't thinking about, well, gee, yeah, I want the peasants to have a vote in everything so they'll have a say in how France is run. Nothing could be further from their minds. When they're talking about the rights of man, they mean the rights of the nobility uh, and wanting to limit the powers of the monarchy. Those ideas that the nobility was quick to adopt in their debates, their confrontations with the crown, uh, were ideas that were widely circulated in France in the 18th century uh, by the French philosophes. And we talked a little bit about them uh, in the first uh, section of the course when we were talking about the early modern period and some of the intellectual ideas that helped give rise to these revolutions in, early, in the early modern world. The philosophes were not uh, really intellectuals uh, as we would think of them today. Uh, most of these people did not concentrate on uh, a particular discipline, you know, of philosophy, what we might call, so let's say, political science or history. Uh, in many ways, they were uh, Renaissance men, men with uh, a variety of ideas about the world, uh, willing to exchange ideas and talk about new concepts, and most of all, uh, being very good at popularizing some ideas that had been fermenting uh, within in the intellectual uh, spheres of Europe for several centuries. So the philosophes are really the kinds of people who, rather than creating wildly new ideas, are simply putting together a set of ideas that had been circulating among intellectuals for some time and are able to convey these ideas uh, to the public in their writings. One of the best known of the philosophes was, of course, Voltaire. And Voltaire's ideas are very typical of Enlightenment thinkers, uh, of people who do see the uh, importance of applying rational thought uh, to analyzing the world around them. Uh, a belief that there are natural laws that govern the universe and govern humankind and that what we need to do is use our reason to discover what those natural laws are so we can then be sure that our societies function in conformity with those ideas. And I should say with those natural laws. One of the ideas that Voltaire is particularly anxious to promote uh, is that of anti-clericalism. The significance of anti-clericalism is not that these people were anti-religious, although some of them did not believe in God, most of them believed in some type of God, uh, but their concern was that the Catholic Church, for example, which was the dominant church in France at this time, you know, even after the Reformation, uh, was corrupted through the centuries. And that clerics in particular often spouted uh, what were no more than superstitious uh, beliefs rather than uh, accurate reflections of religious theology. Uh, that too many clergymen are corrupt, uh, they're clergymen, you know, because it pays an income, uh, they are not devoted to uh, their flocks. They are not uh, 
uh, effective theologians. They do not even know their, their own belief system. So anti-clericalism was really uh, an attack by rationalists on what they saw as an irrational church system. Uh, that the church is peopled in its bureaucracy and its clergy by far too many people who are not dedicated, who are not knowledgeable uh, about the Christian faith and therefore should be dispensed with. Another idea that Voltaire has, uh, which is one that perhaps uh, won him the greatest uh, interest at the time, was that of the enlightened despot. Uh, we'd think of it as an enlightened dictator today, but actually what he was referring to were monarchs who would operate based on enlightened principles. So Voltaire is not calling for democracy by any stretch of the imagination. What he's saying is that we need monarchs who will take the ideas of the Enlightenment and apply them to their administration, their governance of their people. This is how we will have a more efficient and effective society. So Voltaire is by no means revolutionary. Uh, in his ideas. He's not calling for the overthrow of the existing system. What he's saying is monarchs need to look at rational analysis of society as a whole, of the legal system, the feudal system, uh, the church, and see where reform needs to be instituted. These would be the enlightened despots upon whom Voltaire counts to see change come about. So on the one hand, he's certainly not a political revolutionary. But on the other hand, he is suggesting that indeed human beings, in this case particularly uh, uh, kings assisted by enlightenment thinkers, have the ability to dramatically improve their societies by using rational thought, by applying the ideas that they have here, getting rid of corruption, uh, eliminating ignorance, that these kinds of measures can bring on a new age, a far superior form of human society than has existed up until now. Now, Rousseau uh, was another of the French philosophers uh, who was uh, a popularizer, who was well known in uh, both intellectual and popular circles of the 18th century. And Rousseau, at least on the surface, would appear to be exactly the kind of democratic radical and that we would imagine uh, had inspired the French Revolution. Uh, in his work, The Social Contract, and again, these were not new ideas. You know, Rousseau didn't invent these ideas. Many people have been talking about them for several centuries. Uh, he goes after the concept of divine right monarchy, that the monarchy has legitimacy because it has been granted the right to rule by the divinity, by God. And what Rousseau argues is something very different, that legitimacy is based on popular consent. Now, he's not suggesting you need an election to do this. He's theorizing that if monarchs rule, it's not that he's opposed to monarchs again. And that's where we would find that he is not quite the democratic radical that uh, some of his ideas might suggest. When he's talking about popular sovereignty, about this social contract where people grant a right to rule, he's talking about this happening sometime in the past uh, where the people of, let us say, France, granted the right to the House of Bourbon, which was the ruling house at the time, uh, to rule them uh, and to uh, serve their interests. This in itself doesn't sound like that radical an idea. I mean, we're not calling for elections, we're not calling for you know, democratic processes, but it is radical in the sense that what it suggests is that, well, if the crown isn't fulfilling its obligations, that means that it doesn't have the right to go just on ruling as it will. You know, like Charles II thought, gee, in England, nobody has the right to try me because, you know, God put me in this position. Well, Rousseau's ideas are suggesting something very different, that yes, you, know, you may rule us, but you are ruling us because of the consent of the governed. And if you fail to govern effectively, that consent can be withdrawn and you can be removed. To suggest that Rousseau therefore envisioned some type of revolutionary movement such as occurred in France would be really stretching the argument. But the fact is some of his ideas provide the justification for the removal of a monarch and provide a justification for Republican government if you can say, well, look it, we're simply substituting one form of government for another. Both of them, however, are based upon the consent of the governed. 
So this isn't that radical a change. We're not violating some divine law by instituting a republic. And there is, of course, the fact, uh, as I suggested a few minutes ago, that Rousseau's ideas can just as easily be used for the interests of the aristocrats, and they were. I mean, this is the kind of language that the aristocracy spoke when they were critical of the crown. Uh, they were talking about you know, the rights of the governed, the social contract. Uh, it's just that they didn't mean the general populace. They meant themselves. They were the ones that had uh, the right to consent or not to the rule of the crown. So we see here that there are different audiences for the rhetoric of the philosophes. The aristocracy is the first to adopt it. But as we will see, other audiences within French society will quickly adopt many of these same ideas. Uh, the middle class, the rising bourgeoisie of business people, lawyers, etc., the uh, sans culottes, the peasantry, ultimately, all of them will be using some of these ideas, ultimately, to justify their demands and their goals uh, within the revolution. Now, we've talked in the past about how revolutions usually occur not because you've got some type of reactionary government that's trying to suppress all change, but because you've got a government that actually is trying to change the system, the society, the economy. It's just that they aren't very successful in the end. And in trying to reform, they often help set off the revolution itself. So revolutions are not usually against some reactionary autocrat who says, all right, this is the way the world has been for the last 200 years and it's going to stay that way as long as I'm in power. Instead, they usually occur under governments and say, we realize there are a lot of problems with our system. We're going to try to go out and change it. And as they try to do that, they help trigger some of these revolutionary forces. One of the critical reforms attempted in the middle of the 18th century uh, was the creation of the 20e, uh, which means the 20th, but what it translated into, it was to be an income tax. The fact is that the tax on land was simply a basic tax on the amount of land that you have and had nothing to do with how much value you generated from that land. So, for example, a large estate, even though it was producing huge amounts of crops and money uh, for the landlord, uh, was only going to be taxed a relatively minimal amount because it was basic fixed tax based on the size of the property holding itself. So that original tax might be very low because the land is unimproved. You go and improve the land, you're producing products on it, but the tax remains the same. So the land tax did very little to tax the wealth of the elite of the nobility. An income tax, on the other hand, would have had a tremendous impact because it would be on how much income you're generating. That attempt uh, is going to cause serious problems for the crown and bring it, of course, into conflict with the aristocracy. Another attempt uh, at reform, partly because of the aristocracy's resistance to and successful resistance uh, to the income tax, uh, was the attempt to abolish the palmonts. Uh, this is where, of course, the income tax is going to die. You know, the palmonts that are controlled by the aristocracy, they're never going to improve an income tax. You know, it's like getting the Rockefellers you know, and asking them, gee, would you folks like to approve a, you know, an increase in the top rate of income tax in the country, maybe to 50%? Uh, no way. So as a result of that resistance, the Crown tries to fight back by abolishing the palm oils. That effort will also fail. Uh, popular resistance to this, and one of the ways... And one of the reasons why the aristocracy adopts revolutionary rhetoric is because when they're fighting to keep the palmont, uh, one of the things they do is say, look, it, this is arbitrary rule by the government. This violates the social contract. Uh, they're using rhetoric that they know will have wide appeal because other people will agree. You know, not just the aristocracy. Others agree that, no, the government doesn't have the right to just impose taxes at its own will. Uh, it does need consent from the people. So the aristocracy knows what they're doing, at least up to a point, in appealing to a larger audience. So that these efforts are going to be unpopular with much of the population, even though they would tax most heavily the rich, because people don't like the idea of arbitrary government. One of the leading reformers uh, in the government at this time was the Minister Turgot. 
uh, Turgot attempts a series of additional reforms in the face of the earlier failures. Uh, he attempts to abolish uh, the guild system. And, and why? Because the guilds are seen as obstacles to economic growth and change, because they try to maintain stable prices, stable levels of production. So Turgot tries to abolish them. He also tries to abolish uh, what was a very unpopular uh, institution, the corvée. The corvée uh, was, again, a throwback to feudalism. It was the right of the crown and local governments and local authorities uh, to secure labor from the villages. Now, if a road needed to be built, uh, a corvée of 10 workers uh, could be taken from the village to go build a road. What's your compensation for doing this? None. It's basically a tax on your labor. Uh, and this was seen as an unfair and unjust kind of system. And again, it fell basically on the lower classes. Uh, so Turgot has some very worthwhile reforms to try to impose. Uh, and he once again will try tax reform as well. So Turgot epitomizes. He personifies uh, this reformist bent on the part of the French monarchy in the last quarter of the 18th century. They really are. They recognize there are a lot of problems in their system. They're trying to change them, increase taxes on the rich, get rid of the guild system, which they see as uh, an obstacle to economic growth, get rid of the burdensome corvée. All of these things are being attempted by the crown, and they're being adamantly resisted by the aristocracy. And the aristocracy is enduring considerable success in doing that by calling upon these ideas of popular sovereignty. So what we get is a relatively ineffective set of reforms. And in fact, the effort of, by Turgot to institute these reforms uh, leads not to reform, but ultimately to his dismissal. So he's removed from the government. And that is the end of the reforms. And it further strengthens the hands of the Palmonts because they were, of course, the institutions that uh, had resisted most effectively these efforts at change. So in many ways, the reactionary element in French society is successful in fighting off the reforms. These are some of the conditions that we find in France on the eve of the actual revolution itself. And we have at the top of society a privileged aristocracy that pays very little in the way of taxes. And at the same time, we see that the burdens of feudalism, as it still exists in France, are actually getting worse, in part because traditional landlords facing inflation are trying to jack up uh, the dues that are going to be paid by peasants to compensate for inflation, in part because new elements from the urban areas, merchants in particular, are penetrating the countryside, buying up estates, and trying to use them as profit-making entities. And again, trying to secure as much tax return, as much feudal dues as they can from the peasant population. We also see that while the crown recognizes many of the problems that exist in its society, there are important bastions of reaction, meaning particularly the palmonts, okay? the 12 palmonts, uh, the nobility controls that have veto power over royal edicts. And of course, we've had the sale of office for generation upon generation, weakening the hand of the crown in its efforts to use the bureaucracy as a way of bringing about change. So although we have a reforming state, and we have a state which since Louis XIV has been working to increase centralized power, it's in it has increased centralized power. It's increased the income of the state. It's set up the intendant system. But it's also a weak state. It's more centralized than in past generations. But it's clear from these efforts at reform that the state by no means has the ability to simply bring about change as it would, uh, that it's been unable to master or control the aristocracy in its opposition. We also see this penetration of market forces in both the urban areas and in the countryside. And the urban areas as craftsmen turns, turn more towards profit making and away from the guild system. In the countryside as urban elements try to use the old feudal system of collection of dues as a way of generating profits. So we see in both these areas that capitalism is starting to penetrate, starting to have an effect. This is still essentially a feudal society on the surface. But beneath the surface, there are changes going on that are destabilizing relationships in the countryside and in the city. Peasants are deeply 
offended by reaction, uh, reacting against this system where feudal dues are mounting and every old uh, dues, tax, responsibility for labor that can be reborn uh, is being reinstituted and adding to their burdens. And in the urban areas, this division between those who are moving towards a capitalist system and those who want to preserve uh, the old feudal order of guilds. And along the way, a large number of wage earners in both the countryside and the urban areas, and day laborers, who are caught in the midst of this tumult, who are uh, at best on shaky grounds in terms of their employment from day to day, they don't know what's going to happen, who are victims of inflation, of rising prices, uh, and who are longing for some type of control, some type of uh, security for the future in a society in which no type of security really exists for them. And finally, the failure of the state reforms, uh, that the state has tried to change, tried to abolish the guild system, tried to tax the aristocracy, and largely been unsuccessful. So we have here, as a result of these problems, what we can call a series of discontented classes. Here are the actors uh, that are going to be playing their roles in this revolutionary drama. Uh, we've seen the conditions. We've seen the relationship of some of these people to the problems. And now we can sort of list them you know, on the playbill for the drama that will un ensue uh, that we call the French Revolution. There is first the nobility. Uh, to say that they were enlightened thinkers would be wrong, even though they use enlightened uh, terminology from the philosophes, because they don't really have a great vision of the future. You know, what should France be? You know, what should the government be like 100 years from now or 50 years from now? What they're concerned about is, I want to lose what I have now. Okay? I don't want to lose my tax exemptions. I don't want to lose you know, my right to collect uh, seigneurial dues. Uh, I don't want the government getting more and more control uh, over the economy and over society as a whole. I'm opposed to all of that. That's the aristocracy. They essentially want to prevent reforms, uh, prevent the changes that the crown is trying to institute. But in the process, we also see that they are using rhetoric, uh, which they know is popular, which will gain them support in the larger society, uh, but which also has a danger to it because that same rhetoric can be used by others uh, to justify the toppling of the aristocracy. Now, if this is a society in which all are to be equal, in which there is to be consent of the governed, well, the aristocracy thinks only of themselves as the governed. Uh, they don't think of the peasants and the merchants and the craftsmen uh, as members of the governed. They're just you know, commoners at the bottom of the barrel. But these other groups are going to pick up on that language. And furthermore, when the aristocracy starts challenging the crown to such an extent that it does, they will weaken the legitimacy and the power of the crown and open opportunities for these other revolutionary groups. For the peasantry, their opposition is to feudalism, but a new kind of feudalism, if you will, capitalism uh, and feudalism. In other words, uh, using the feudal system as a profit-making, revenue-generating system, which both the old aristocracy and new landowners are doing. This is setting off uh, deep-seated discontents in the countryside. Uh, one of the strengths of the feudal audit was that it was stable. Things remained the same. Here we're getting a situation where we still have a feudal order, but it's creating instability as these groups try to extract more wealth from the peasants, and the peasants increasingly resist that prospect. Both the peasants and the sans culottes, the lower orders uh, in urban society, particularly in Paris, are concerned with issues of inflation and price declines. Uh, inflation, particularly for people in urban areas, because what they have seen over time is a rising cost of living for themselves, particularly for food. For peasants, what they often face is just the opposite, that they see the prices for the goods that they can produce declining. Uh, much like American farmers, what's happening? Often middlemen uh, who get control of the grain and then sell it for far more in the urban setting. So here we've got two different groups with two different concerns. Peasants want higher food prices or higher prices for the crops they produce. The urban groups are concerned with just the opposite. They want lower food prices to bring down their cost of living. And finally, the middle classes. 
people like lawyers, small business people, who are concerned particularly with opening up the system, uh, whether it's the economic system, the political system, the bureaucratic system, opening it up to careers of talent, meaning whether it's economic enterprise, whether it's positions in government, uh, I should have an opportunity at those positions based on my abilities. That's how we should determine what happens in the society, whether it's in the economy, in the political order, and the social order. Those who rise to the top should be the most talented, not those who are privileged by birth. So here we have our actors. Here we see the discontents that they bring uh, to late 18th century France. And when we come back in the second half, we will see how the forces interact and bring on the most radical revolution of the early modern world.